it's hilarious to watch the uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, the feedback that we get from consumers, mm -hmm. uh, because of course some of the feedback is you know uh, you know correct honest analysis of, of of things which are wrong within the game, mm -hmm. uh, like for example you know a crash is clearly wrong, and yeah. so people have a clear justification to be frustrated or annoyed at something like that mm -hmm. happening. But it's also interesting to point out how many people kind of take sides on a variety of issues, which are very complex social issues. Uh, but you know, since everyone's playing in one world together, uh, and you know, this this the experience can't be customized for any one individual. In a sense, that when you play a solo player game, the beginning of the game will be the same for every person who plays it, or effectively the same for every person who plays it. In a world with you know 80,000 participants so far and growing. Well, sometimes when players start, you're going to be start in amongst very friendly people, and sometimes when you start, you might find a piece, of, a group of either boring people, mm -hmm. or a group of uh, you know people who have attitudes towards life and how to play the game that you don't agree with. And uh, uh, you know that's both the uh, the beauty and the risk of of creating something like this online world we've created. So uh, we've spent the first few months of its operation here uh, trying to. Uh, fine-tune the game such that we kind of maximize everybody's opportunity for early understanding and early comfortable enjoyment, yet also s retain the maximum capability for long-term uniqueness of life. Even at, with the outset, you know, since we did a long beta test cycle as well, uh, and actually, quite frankly, even before we launched the beta test, uh, you know, there were already kind of guilds and you know, subgroups forming for various purposes. Uh, so when we went live day one, we already had a fairly rich community activity already. Uh, but, and, so it's, and so it's evolved very quickly from there. And, and of course, the evolution, like you say, is very early in its uh, long-term build. Uh, but almost immediately, you saw things like, uh, you know, the game supports you know, a huge array of activities. There's about, uh, about half the players participate in what you might consider adventuring, in the sense that they go out and hunt creatures or monsters and collect treasure and you know build up their either magic or combat skills and about half the community participates in what you might call the economy in the sense of they generally hang out in towns they develop their skills of creation uh, and trade and they kind of build the infrastructure that supports society and interestingly those people tend to be what I might describe as the better personal role-playing gamers in the sense of you know I'm a uh, purist when it comes to the definition of the term role-playing games, and I think there are very few computer games which really classify as role-playing games in the marketplace. You know, a role-playing game is, in my mind, a, a game whose structure uh, encourages kind of uh, theatrical play on the part of the players, uh, and you know, I consider role-playing kind of the most base form of play that goes back to your earliest play in childhood, where you would take G.I. Joes or Legos, and you know you talk about the adventures of these characters. That's role playing, and uh, a game which encourages that is uh, 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 is a true role playing game. So sorry about that digression. But uh, uh, how these communities are building again? Uh, you know, first we have that kind of split. The next thing we have is uh, you know the, the next kind of split that showed up is a lot of the early adopters of Ultima were kind of fell into two camps. One of which are the role-playing gamers, the, a, a la lots of old Ultima players, and another big camp is what you might call the Quake, Doom, Diablo players, uh, who came into the game and immediately started to rampage, and their, whole, they, you know, their, their philosophy of life was bent upon destruction of each other and everybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, and, and this group of players, of course, uh, you know, cries foul play, to which we as the creators go, no, 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 that's not foul play. It just needs to be very carefully managed within the fictional scope of the game. Uh, so that was kind of the first kind of split. Uh, then another thing that came up as, as that kind of settled and as the rules of the game and the laws within Britannia kind of being to kind of draw lines in the sand of safety uh, and uh, the proper amount of safety and the proper amount of uh, fear. Uh, the next thing that began is uh, what I'll call kind of player-built cities and player-built communities. One of the things you can do in the game is you can buy hard assets like homes and castles and things of that nature. And we're beginning to see now uh, you know, villages independent of the uh, Britannian uh, protection of the main cities start up in the world, which means these player-built cities have to self-regulate, self-govern, 
self-protect, uh, uh, which takes a pretty large commitment on the part of a large number of players to really pull it off successfully. So uh, as those evolve, we've also need, had to help, even within game code, support that endeavor because we like that community emerging. And so people would do things like, uh, um, you know, you can, uh, like I mentioned, you can build homes and you can lock that home and you can hire a guard to guard the home. Uh, but other very clever players would find uh, clever ways to break in, so to speak. Uh, for example, people found that they could get into the inside of castles by building, by ha using their carpentry skills to build crates and then stacking crates like a staircase <laughs> and, uh, you know, and invade the castle walls in that fashion. Uh, so, uh, you know, some of the players went, hey, that's cheating, which we went as the creators, we went, no, that's not, that's perfectly fair. Mm -hmm. However, we don't, we want you to be able to protect your home, so now we've added the feature of traps. So they can actually set along the battlements uh, <laughs> entrapments okay. to protect themselves. So we're we're feeding, they are continually feeding these communities with new features mm -hmm. to help kind of uh, support the reality that's building. And what the players are finally now, after a couple of months of playing, realizing, I mean, even some of our most vocal um, complainers of two months ago have now become our most ardent supporters now, and of course they're playing the whole time through, uh, as they realize, you know, that no, 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 it's, you know, we shouldn't make rules to just stop things which are, uh, which some people don't like. We should provide people the tools by which they can discourage play styles they don't like. Uh, and so the community can build itself. And players are learning that new play paradigm, which heretofore has not really existed. A few days ago, in fact, uh, well, I actually started when, when I was out of town one time, this, uh, this character who calls himself the Hulkster, kind of a you know wrestling federation kind of thing, and in fact has created an attire which you know, looks uh, very gaudy of that ilk. Yeah, yeah. You know, he uh, uh, he while I was out of town, sent me an email challenging me to a duel and published and posted this all over the boards, mm -hmm. uh, challenging me to a wrestling match. Well, since uh, Star Long, who plays the Lord British's kind of uh, um, ally and opponent, mm -hmm. uh, Blackthorn. Uh, since he got the email as well, he replied to the guy and said, well, you know, unfortunately, Lord British isn't available this week, but, you know, I'll take your challenge. And so they, uh, uh, through the web, you know, began to send all these taunts to each other, and, and so they kind of, that kind of helped build, build up the hype. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out, before the event occurred, I actually returned from being out of town, so I attended as well, but I, uh, the way we did it, and so, you know, the, the wrestling match was every bit as authentic as any other professional wrestling match you've seen. Uh, and so we uh, uh, actually out along some sandy beach, they built this wrestling arena. Hundreds of people showed up to watch this event, and including Hul this guy Hulkster had a bunch of followers who were all kind of dressed similarly. They were kind of his part of the crowd, and uh, Lord British's jester Chuckles was there to help officiate, and Blackthorn has a jester named Heckles, who's kind of the rude and obnoxious version of Chuckles who travels the world, so he was there too. And uh, you know, the Hulkster and uh, uh, Blackthorn wrestled, uh, you know, for quite some time, and so they were, you know, punching each other, and eventually Blackthorn, uh, you know, kind of, you know, submitted and said, you know, you win, at which point in time Lord British shows up, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, kind of a standard wrestling kind of thing where, you know, somebody from the audience always jumps in and disrupts, so we had, anyway, you get the idea. We had this very elaborately staged uh, event. Uh, there was really a huge amount of fun, because not only were not only was it fun just to watch from the other player standpoint, but mm -hmm. uh, you know the, the appropriate amount of jeers from the crowd. Plus, in Ultima Online, the crowds can get unruly, mm -hmm. which they did, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know so we had to have tons of game masters on on site too to be you know ejecting unruly <laughs> participants and unruly uh, the crowd members and things like that. So it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Currently, it's an unwritten policy, but we're probably going to publish it as um, as a formal policy that we want to hear about player run events throughout the world mm -hmm. and whichever one week to week we think is the coolest we're going to go attend mm -hmm. and that'll we think will encourage players to want to do something mm -hmm. that's cool to try to get us as origin to go attend those in person mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're, that's really kind of what we're doing anyway but we're going to kind of formalize that plus we have a calendar of events now which has at the moment weekly major events and daily minor events mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, to kind of keep the, you know, spice up the activities within the world. Right. We assume this is a lifetime commitment of, of sorts, <laughs> um, in the sense of ultimately we presume that when we release, you know, 
Ultima Online Roman numeral 2, uh, that we'll find a way to migrate those players onto the next game. Uh, but until then, we're presuming this is, you know, we're, we're, we're here for the long haul. Ultima Online Roman numeral 2 will be a whole new ground up technology based very much like Ultima 9. Um, uh, and so that will not be an iterative patch that people can get. That'll be a new product they'll have to buy. However, mid-year next year, we hope to release a, uh, what you might call, uh, Ultima Online 1 expansion, um, which may be able to be downloadable or may have to be purchased uh, retail. Uh, odds are good, actually, it'll have to be purchased retail. But in addition to that, we're patching this game constantly in the sense that we're at not, but not adding geography. Geography, geography and art are very large uh, data-wise. And so those kinds of things will probably accumulate and release as a CD. Features, or at least as many as we can features, we're just going to continue to give people as part of their ongoing monthly subscription. That's kind of one of the things you get is continued improvements of features and technology within the game.